loved um, Greg's reference to working girls because I'm actually starting my sermon with a, another movie that I haven't seen in a couple decades. How many of you here ever saw the movie Dances with Wolves? Amen, right? <laughs> this is one of my favorite movies of all time, and if it's been a little while, I of course suggest you watch it again, but for those of you who might not see it, and for those of you who need a refresher, let me tell you a little bit about the plot. So Kevin Costner, who of course did his um, uh, acting, directing, and producing bits, played the role of a Union Army lieutenant who asks to be posted out on the Western frontier. He says he wants to experience that land before it's gone for good. So he arrives out at this Union Army base in 1864 to discover that it's utterly deserted, overrun, poorly stocked, and begins to set his life in order. He lives there with a great sense of solitude and begins to begin a friendship with a wolf who comes for food. And during this time where he's soul searching, the native Sioux Braves attempt to steal his one and only horse. Now, the horse is smarter than all of them and so is captured but just makes it back to its corral with no problem. But Kevin Costner just feels that this isn't quite the way that he wants to be with his neighbors, let's say. So he decides to deck himself out to the nines and ride over to their camp to introduce himself to them. And on the way, he discovers this woman called Standing with Fist, who was a, who as a white child was found and adopted by the Sioux medicine chief, Kicking Bird. And she was there mourning, doing a ritual self-cutting as she grieved her husband. And Kevin Costner picked her up, put her on the horse, and brought her back to her people. And that act began a friendship, a series of exchanges until little by little, Kevin Costner really began to discover the wonderful qualities in his neighbors, their loyalty and courage, honor and valor, their humor and playfulness. And he began to become one of their people until finally they give him a name, Dances with Wolves because they love how playful he is with his wolf friend. He hunts buffalo with them, fights off attack by another tribe, and eventually has made the commitment to live amongst them as a full member of their community when, as fate would have it, the Union Army moves back, moves into that fort, and he's discovered, captured, and named a traitor to the United States. The Sioux, viewing him as a brother, actually managed to engineer his escape, but he knows and can tell that the Union Army is going to hunt him down. So grievous was this crime against them. And he decides to turn himself in to be tried as a traitor versus having the Sioux tribe pursued and hunted while they're hunting for him. This wonderful movie came back to me this week when I was reading a book that several of you recommended called Tribes by Sebastian Jungin. And Jungin points out that the example in Dances with Wolves was hardly unique. Actually, starting as early as 1612, Virginians were noticing that Europeans were sort of moving in the dozens to go live with Native Americans, giving up what was actually greater economic security, technological advances um, that they would have enjoyed staying with the Westerners. And so Ben Franklin and all these other 
colonials were trying to figure out why were so many people of European descent going to live with the Native Americans, and yet they couldn't find a single example of a Native American who said, I'd rather do the reverse. What Jung postulates is that over the million years of our evolutionary development, human beings became hardwired for tribalism. That we became so accustomed to living in small groups that were in deep relationship and utterly interdependent. There are certain values that come to the forefront when you're in such a relationship as that. One of the values is a deep, abiding appreciation for loyalty, for people willing to take responsibility for one another. You see this sometimes actually in more modern times with coal miners, when there is an accident in the shafts and there's a collapse, how much they work together to provide care as they can, medical assistance, to share water and any food, how those at the surface will immediately go and start digging out their comrades, even if it's not quite safe to do so yet. There's a deep, abiding sense of responsibility for one another. There's also this deep appreciation for the ways that we contribute, each of us, in an interdependent relationship. Competency becomes so meaningful. What are you good at? Are you good at shoring up those mine shafts? Are you really good at finding the berries? Are you a particularly good hunter or basket weaver? Are you good at telling stories that give hope when times look a little bleak? Those competencies ensure survival. There's also this great value placed, and I think these intertwined acts of courage and sacrifice. How much are you willing to give for the collective good? Are you willing to give your belongings, the food you have stored? Are you willing to give up your place and travel somewhere else? Are you willing to risk your life to go and rescue another? How, Jung and asks, do you become an adult in a society that doesn't ask you to sacrifice? How do you gain honor in a society that no longer asks you to be courageous? The power of being part of a tribe, of being part of a people bound together by those practices and values was so strong that Virginia and the other colonies began to pass strict laws punishing Europeans for crossing over or for being parts of other communities, African Americans or many of the other cultural communities that were early members of our shores. And I think an interesting thing happened with that is that we began to draw kind of larger tr tribal lines based on race and color versus on that kind of tight-knit, cohesive quality. So for a long time, kind of your tribe was being white or black or Hispanic, and those were your people. And I think part of that meant that you were unwilling to cross out of your people because you didn't know if you left that you would have any place of belonging at all. If you gave up being white, or you gave up being black, you knew that you weren't marked culturally or in your appearance with the trademarks of belonging to other groups. And so there was this fear that you would have nowhere to belong. And the fear of not belonging 
is probably one of the most powerful fears that we have and keeps us afraid and often in our place. I would say in the last several decades that, the, that those boundaries have weakened. Now we recognize that we can find family and belonging and place and community with people of all different backgrounds. And that's true even though those old patterns set in those early days of our colonies are still pervasive among us. And yet we face perhaps even greater challenges. Social scientists say that modern society actually poses truly great threats to our ability to be in tribes. That current day affluism, that, our, that we are able to provide for ourselves and live on our own and you know, that we don't see the immediate needs for sharing for our immediate survival, actually means we live in a greater sense of isolation. And more importantly, less is being asked of us. Unlike even 100 years ago, 200 years ago, it is very possible for every person in this room to go through life and never truly have to ask the question about whom am I willing to sacrifice for. We're never asked generally to sacrifice our lives for another or for values we believe in. We're rarely even asked to sacrifice a dinner, one meal to help support another. Modern society has taken away our most essential need to be significant, to be of use for work. As the poet Marcy, Percy said, Marge Percy said, for work that is real. So here we are in 2016, deeply coded for tribalism, recognizing that the racist structures that we were most commonly, that were most historically accessible to us are kind of repugnant to us at the same time, that those structures broke down the kind of ethnic heritage that used to group us together by small village or ethnic grouping. So what do we do? How do we find and fulfill our deep calls for belonging and interdependence? In one way or another, I've been wondering about this for a good 15 years, trying to find my people, looking for places where they were, and every once in a while, I step in to a little tribal community that's gathered for a conference for a week, and you could just see that I got some joy going on. But I've begun to recognize that I can claim a tribe, and I could claim a people based on shared values, and really based on the way that we answer the question, what are we willing to sacrifice for? For me, my people and my tribe are the people who say, I'm willing to sacrifice my reputation, my livelihood, my economic security, even my physical security to help bring about a greater sense of unity and peace within the peoples of this American society the people who are willing to protest racialized injustice, who are willing to stand up and protect immigrants coming across the border, who are willing to help women gain security in their bodies and in their livelihoods. It's the justice workers who I know are my tribe. And I go to them every now and then again, and I said, I'm doing this. Am I demonstrating my competency to you? Or call me 
if you need a story of hope or someone to lean on. And we start to form the patterns of behavior of, of relying on one another that sustain us. And they're the faces that come to mind to sustain me. Many of these people are Unitarian Universalists, though not all of them. So my spiritual companions, I urge you to reflect on what you'd be willing to sacrifice, on whom you'd be willing to sacrifice for, on what competencies you would seek to develop and that you would call on others to rely upon you for. To develop stories, to share about whom you love and what you love and what you dream to see. And listen for people telling that same story. Maybe we'll find them and hear them here together. But I urge you to find your people and there discover a great sense of belonging, your great significance, and for you to be loyal to those. May it be so, and amen.